Yes, yes, y'all. What's going on? The Breaking Barriers podcast is back in full effect. I'm your host, Daniel Robertson, here with my main man, Zay Bama, Hello. Mr. Xavier Lamar, a uh, special guest that's with us today, Mr. Ivory Robinson, CEO and president of Harp Data Connections. Connections. All right. Hey. I almost said collections. We know you're not, <laughs> we know you're not in the collections <laughs> no, agency business, that. all right? Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Robinson. Um, excited to kind of hear about the work that you're that you've that you've been leading and things that you've kind of done and uh i'll we'll kick it over to you just uh kind of induce yourself a little bit thanks man well first of all thank you guys both for the opportunity to be here um i always uh, appreciate a platform to be able to speak in in any sense because i feel like too often we don't really get this chance right to sit amongst uh other brown people and say these are the things that i'm doing and this is this is how we're breaking barriers so um, I listened to the podcast. I think what you guys are doing amazing. I think the content that you guys are developing is amazing. And so I just appreciate again, the opportunity to be here. Uh, like, like you said, uh, I'm CEO of Harp data connections, uh, it consulting firm. Uh, we've been here in Buffalo for going on now six years, um, doing everything from, um, high level infrastructure to making sure that, uh, kids get laptops and, um, wireless devices. So uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a gamut of things in between there, but uh, I don't want to bore everybody with the technical talk. We, we're, 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 we do a lot of uh, technical consulting and really just helping businesses and organizations do better when it comes to the technology decisions that they make. Okay. Well, we appreciate you being here. Uh, before we kind of dig into all the tech talk, because I know you're going to break us off and edu- educate us a little bit I'm today. Try. Um, I want to get a feel for... Who was uh, Ivory Robinson before mm. uh, CEO and president titles, man? Because I, I know you're originally from Houston, right? But Originally, yeah. Um, you and your mom? I'm, I'm a Buffalonian. Though. Okay. Uh, my mom was in the Army, so that's kind of how we got here. Uh, once she got out, she, she wanted something different. So I've been in Buffalo. Well, we came back to Buffalo when I was three. Okay. Uh, I grew up uh, in, on the east side, Central Park. Uh, during the, the, the height of the crack epidemic and the war on drugs. So... I've, I've, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm 41 now. I feel like I've lived probably five different lives and, uh, starting out early on, I, I was on the wrong side of this digital divide that I always talk about. Uh, I, we didn't have much, you know, it was five, seven of us living in, uh, one house with one bathroom. Uh, I went to Riverside high school, uh, graduated bottom of my class. Um, like third from the bottom of my class and was just, you know, fortunate to be able to grow up in that area during that time when there was so much going on, violence and drugs and and just all type of things. And to be able to at least graduate high school and have an opportunity to do something different that, um, that is, you know, really what um, I feel like that time that being growing up here in Buffalo, that is what really made me who I am today. Um, I, Graduated high school, I went to the Air Force. I was fortunate enough to to join the Air Force, and that's I really feel like that's when things turned around. Um, going into Air Force, I, I learned so many different things. I learned more importantly, most importantly, how to deal with other people. A lot of times, growing up here in Buffalo, especially you know in the in the eighties and nineties, growing up on the East Side, it's almost like you, you there's these walls put up around you. There's no real reason for you to go outside of the hood. There's no real reason for you to go and explore different areas and meet different people. So I only really knew one type of people and going into the military teaches you how to engage and how to, how to become a team member. Right. And in the military, it's a lot, it's, it's, it's all about the team and meeting so many people from different diverse backgrounds that really helped me understand that there's more out there than what's, what's in the East side of Buffalo. So um, I, I got I gained access to technology in the Air Force. That's where I really, really got introduced to it. And one of the things that, that I talk about most often is that digital divide, that that gap that exists between those that have access to the Internet and the technology, but also the know how, like just the technical know how to be able to keep up. And so I was on the I, I, I always go back to that graduating bottom of my class where I was on the wrong side of that divide. I didn't have the opportunity to leverage technology to get ahead in school. I didn't have that opportunity to be able to use the internet and understand 
more about why it was important to graduate and go to high school and take the SATs, all these things that I didn't have an opportunity to do. I didn't understand that. So uh, going into the Air Force, it just taught me so many things. And I was fortunate uh, to be able to get out and get a job in uh, Washington, D.C. I uh, worked in the in the D.C. capital region for probably 12 years uh, doing uh, IT solutions, right? I was I had done everything from help desk to where I was architecting and designing multi-million dollar IT solutions for the federal government, healthcare agencies, municipalities, uh, the military healthcare, just a, a, a plethora of different organizations that I've, I've built IT solutions for. And in 2016, I, I said, I want to uh, try something different and started my business, moved to Buffalo, and then the rest is kind of history. So moved back to Buffalo, I should say. Man, that's crazy, dude. So you dropped a lot of phrases in that. Uh, <laughs> first thing I was shocked by, you talking about you in your 40s, you don't look a day past 30. Yeah, well, but, you know, time has been good to me for the most part. I, was gonna, I see. <laughs> um, so you got to answer this for me, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, even as I was kind of doing, you know, a little homework on you mm -hmm. and even listening to you now, how does a young man wind up a, a young man that grew up on the east side mm -hmm. uh didn't graduate nowhere near the top of his high school mm -hmm. class uh, from a buffalo product of a buffalo public school um you know grow up in the elements that we all know at least if you live in buffalo what it's like to grow up on the east side mm -hmm. how does Besides. you know how do you how do you transition from that to you know where you are in life now and it sounds like that move to the air force was a was a a, a turning point in your life Absolutely. but most young men don't even think about going to to the air force so like what triggered that move well you know i i, I consider myself very fortunate and blessed that uh, both my parents uh my mom and then my late dad uh, were are, are both ministers uh, and they raised us in the church and so although we were on the east side and kind of in the midst of all of the things that go on in that area, we weren't allowed to, um, we weren't allowed to engage in a lot of other things that were going around, going on in the neighborhood. My parents were very strict. Um, they were very, very involved. Like we had no privacy. We couldn't close doors. You know, they, they just, there wasn't really the opportunity for us to, to get out and, become a member of that level that that level of the society and so the what what was not as um, prevalent as church and god and my and when, as, as at least for me growing up was education right i'm the i'm the last of 10 kids right so um and, my, and five of those are all uh, on my mom's side so by the time it got to me you know, my parents weren't necessarily engaged with my education and they weren't necessarily engaged in making sure that my homework is done and all these things. So I kind of skated by and the unfortunate position of being at Riverside High School was that they didn't really care either. Right. A lot of the teachers there were just there to be, you know, just there to work and to collect a paycheck. I think we all know the history and the reputation that that school has. And so I was a living product of that. I was a, I was not a great kid. I, I used to fight and I used to, you know, um, do all of the things that I, I got away with as much as I could, you know, that my mother would allow me to get away with. And when I graduated, I didn't immediately go to the Air Force. I, I kind of like, you know, just piddled around for a little bit. I delivered pizzas and then I was out delivering pizzas one day and the police pulled me over. My registration was expired. Boop, boop. <laughs> I, had, I had a I had a pizza in the car to deliver and they took the car from me. So um, that was kind of a point where my mom was like, you got to do something. You got You have to do something. So she called the recruiter for me. And, you know, I just at that point, I just wanted something. Right. I, just, I needed something because I, I had no real direction. And so I, I took a shot. I just said, I'm going to I'm going to go and do this and I'm going to put my all in, in it. And what I found when I got to the Air Force is that they cared about my education. Because, because taxpayers are paying for it, right? They mm -hmm. care about my success. They care about making sure that when I go out there, I was an air traffic controller, which is, which is an extremely difficult career field. But they need to make sure that when I went out there and I started talking to planes, there's real people in these planes. And so what we can't have is, is to have somebody in the Air Force be responsible for some sort of major disaster, airplane crash or something right. like that. So, they, so they're invested. 
And that's, I didn't have that prior to getting into the air force and that structure and that rigor and, uh, the, the constant reinforcement is, is what really put me in a position to understand that there's more required for me in order to be successful. And, and I didn't get those lessons when I was, you know, in high school in Buffalo. So again, like you said, I think the air force was probably the most pivotal move of, you know, my life that really changed the direction. And then post air force, it's just been about working hard. The, the, the lessons that I didn't, the lessons that I didn't learn exclusively here in Buffalo, but, or not necessarily, not necessarily that I didn't learn them lessons that I didn't take heed to in Buffalo, that hustle mentality and that you have to work hard and you always have to be out grinding. I didn't even fully understand, stand those until I got all the other structure and understanding pieces that I got in the air force. That's dope, man. man hats sure. off to you, man. Salute. For real, for real. It, um, before I kick it over to Xavier, uh, you also mentioned the term digital divide, mm. right? And I know some people, when they hear that, they know exactly what you're talking about. But there are other people who they're just not aware of what that is and how detrimental it is, especially to people, um, people of color, Absolutely. especially in a black community. Absolutely. Um, so can you talk, you know, kind of break down what is the digital divide and, you know, talk about the work that you've been doing with that? Absolutely. So so the digital divide is is defined as that gap that exists between those that have access to those things we talked about, technology, the internet, the understanding, the digital literacy, and then those that don't, right? Which a lot of times are, are, we find, find in the uh, uh, poor communities and underprivileged here in the, in the city. But the reality is that you also have the rural communities where there's not a lot of, lot of individuals who look like, like us that are also suffering. You have the, the, you know, these Indian reservations that are in the middle of nowhere that don't have, don't even have access to the internet. And so there, there's a, this, this digital divide that exists it's throughout the country is defining this generation that's, that's coming up in school right now. There's going to be a, a visible and tangible difference between those that had the access over these last two years and those that didn't. Um, there's 141 million Americans right now that don't have access to the internet, right? That's, that's, there's, there was 160 million that voted in the last election. So, so you're, you're talking about a mass quantity of individuals, both black, brown, white, everything that don't have access to the ability to learn. I talked to a young lady a few weeks ago and she said, you know, there were students that she she's tutoring that didn't get a device for 10 weeks, right? So you talk about not having access to internet and now you don't have access to a device. If remote learning is the only way that you, you're able to consume information, you don't have the internet and you don't have a device, what do you have, right? And when I asked her the question, how, how long does it take for those students to keep up? She said, they're still not caught up. The year's almost half over and they're still not caught up. They probably won't get caught up this year. So now take that and multiply it by two because there's kids that haven't been connected to school for two years. That's the digital divide. That digital divide, it's tangible. And what's, what's most alarming is that every day it gets worse because what we did as a society in March of last year was we said, we have to figure out a way to make sure kids can learn. We got to make sure that people can work from home. So the tech, we put all this investment and capital into the ability to do just that, work from home, learn from home. And the individuals that, that in the very beginning didn't have access to those things, now they're even further behind because the whole world is now moving ahead and, and they're stuck in the same place. So this, this is, I talk about it with this kind of passion because it's scary to me because I grew up on that, on that other side. So, so what would have happened to me if somebody didn't come along and introduce me to technology or I wasn't able to get to it? I, I, I fear for the youth and the, the, the school age generation now on what their future lo looks like and, and how hard and how long it's going gonna, it's gonna to be for them to get caught up. Yo, that's real rap right there. Uh, um, and Xavier, you know, I think this is a good segue for you because you as a as a high school student, mm -hmm. you had to go through and sit through that, you know, almost two years now of, 
you know, virtual learning in school. And here you are, senior, about to make that transition, next transitional step in your life. Um, so, you know, what are your what are your thoughts on just what it's been like for you from a, a, a technological standpoint over the last couple of years? Uh, it has definitely been stressful. Like kids always talk about how they really never want they don't want to be in school but trust me like kids now that we definitely want to be with school because like having to deal like with the doing virtual learning on the internet is like a, a strain on our minds especially mm-hmm. when there's always confusion about getting into the classroom uh the internet down or something and, and you're right that do like really hurt our, hurt our education so mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think this has definitely been very stressful for me, very stressful for everyone who's doing virtual learning right now. Yeah, it's 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 stressful for, I think, not just the students, but also the, the educators yeah. as well. Yeah. You're looking at a place where, at least in New York, where absences are up 14 to 15 percent um, across the state. Right. Nationwide, you're looking at an 11 percent increase in absences. And it's and, and the it's not just because they don't have the access, but now you're taking a, a glimpse into into a lot of students' homes and and they're embarrassed at what's going on behind them. They're afraid of being ridiculed and mocked because of what's going on behind them. Like working, uh, I'm sorry, learning from home that's a very stressful thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know my my daughter, she's seven, right, mm-hmm. second grade. And uh, I've been blessed because she kind of she's adapted. She's still doing the virtual piece. I was like, yeah, I am not not really feeling uh, the fact that sending her back to school right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know there's some parents that are definitely struggling with that piece. Yeah, um, it had been since the beginning. Yeah, it's it's tough. It's tough for for parents. And um, you know, my kids are in virtual learning, and I'm fortunate that their mom has uh, a job where she can work remotely and be there every day to make sure that they're doing the things that they can. You, that's a, uh, one of the things that we don't talk about enough are the parents that aren't allowed to go to work or aren't allowed to um, go and engage in their normal life because they have to be home educating their children. And you're having, you know, millions and millions of families that are now living below the poverty line, not really getting an income or, or bringing an income into the home. And you can't go out and work. You don't have that opportunity to go out and do something else. It's a, it's a, when I, when I use the word crisis, I don't use it lightly. I I just, I, it frustrates me that more people don't understand how, how critical of a position we're in right now. Yeah. You can put it right up there with, you know, some of the other crises that we have, especially in our communities and neighborhoods. When you talk about just violence and gun violence, Mm -hmm. that's a crisis. That's a crisis. Mm -hmm. That's a crisis. <laughs> it is. I, I think that what what the the internet should be it, it 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 should be just as the availability should be the same as water or electricity or heat. It's a it's it's a civil right at mm-hmm. this point. And, and when you talk about the racial divide, right, and how many uh, black and brown people don't have access, that's a civil right. You you have you have so many millions of people that don't have access to something that you need to live. You can't get COVID information via the paper or via, you know, word of mouth. You can't get, you know, the the requirements to get to school, right? Uh, the schedule for school and all these things. You can't get those if you don't have the internet. There's some places, um, New York, there's a lot of, there's, a, there's some project housing buildings in New York City that, that have hundreds of thousands of uh, residents they're required to pay their rent online. But if you don't have access to the internet, how do you pay your rent? Then you're getting evicted. It's, 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 this, the system is is not set up right now for us to be successful, and it's just getting worse. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I think with the internet, I think over the years, it's definitely... It. I think when you have certain things in society that have become like, a, like an important necessity, like healthcare mm-hmm. and education, I think that's when we need to really start looking at... like taking that really off the table and really saying, no, we need to guarantee this as a human right, like for like every citizen, because just uh, the fact of how many people depend on it. So yeah, absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, the, the, where you really see um, when you talk about the, the racial divide, where you really see it show its faces in the funding, right? The government is putting massive amounts of money 
into the rural communities to, to combat this digital divide. And, and I'm not going to, I don't want to talk down on that, right? Mm-hmm. Because it is, it, because they need the internet as well. But you have an overwhelming amount of underserved, un- underprivileged students that are living in the, in the inner cities that are black and brown. They just simply can't afford it. Uh, you talk about Buffalo and all that we've gone through, you know, through this COVID and Buffalo public schools has, has put a ton of work into trying to get all their students connected. Uh, we had spectrum spectrum come through and, right, and yeah. offer, you know, the free internet for a couple months. And then that was it. And now that program doesn't even exist anymore. So you have to ask the question now, how are we going to create a system that's sustainable? How do we create internet access that's sustainable? Because right now it's not mobile hotspots and leveraging, you know, outside um, internet, you know, sitting outside of Starbucks, that's not sustainable. And so as a, as a country, we need legislation that's going to bring funding into the city to come to combat the same Mm -hmm. thing. So I'm going to ask you the million dollar question Mm -hmm. because you kind of, you already started to lean that way in regards to uh, how I think we kind of solve this. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's scary because with the digital divide, Mm -hmm. we already know there was uh, an educational gap, Mm -hmm. especially for black and brown people, people of color. And the digital divide is just helping to, further expand that Mm -hmm. you know and it's something that we're gonna have to deal with and people aren't necessarily talking about right now um you know we was already behind the eight ball been behind the eight ball for 400 plus years right um so how do we i'm gonna backtrack if you had everything that you needed at your fingertips how would you go about solving the 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 digital divide that exists well so that that's just it right there isn't there isn't a one size fits all solution to every problem and that's also part of why i'm embarking on this project now to drive across america to to go into these different communities that are affected and help them close their digital divide right um when you look at the inner city and the problems that we're having keeping kids connected um their solution is going to be different than the community that can't even get access to the internet at all. Our problem in the city is we don't have the money problem outside of the city is they don't have the internet. And and so each individual community is going to have to approach it in a different manner. How we come up, how we come up with that solution is going to be based on the factors that exist within, within the the community and the environment. One of the things that, that we do, you know, one of the things heart data connections does as a function of business is we provide technical solutions. And, and what that means is that if there's a problem from a technical perspective, we will provide a tech technological innovation or, or some sort of technology to be able to solve that problem. My mission now going across the country is going to be comprised of me going into these communities and understanding what their problem is so that I can provide a technical solution to it. So I can Mm -hmm. leverage my network to be able to solve that problem. There isn't a resource right now where you can go. If you live in an area that doesn't have a Google or Apple or Amazon or one of these large cities. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And and it it doesn't have to be a small city, right? Buffalo suffers from that. Cleveland suffers from that. Detroit, right? We hear about that a lot, a lot right. now in the news. It doesn't have to be a small city, but there are areas that are technical hotbeds like Sunnyvale, California, and Washington, D.C., and New York City, um, Austin, Texas, right? They don't have these same problems because all the technology is there. But in the parts of the country where they don't have these resources, they don't have a way to find the answer. They don't have they don't have a way to to understand what options are available to them. Mm-hmm. And so the only way to, to truly close this digital divide is to be able on a, to be able to raise awareness to what these different solutions are to all these different problems mm-hmm. on a larger platform. So what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to, I'm creating this video series um, and a podcast called driving innovation, where, like I said, I'll be driving across the country and going into these diverse communities, talking with the leadership and talking with the business owners 
and understanding what their divide is and trying to help them provide a solution to it. That's dope, man. So is that, have you already started that? When is that going to kick off? Well, I, I've started it. I've started filming already. Okay. Um, I started filming here in Buffalo and I've already kind of started working on uh, the, my location that I'm, that I've been filming in Pennsylvania. The official kickoff is not going to be on until the 22nd of March, but I'll be, I'll be jumping on the road with really three locations already filmed and ready to go. Nice. Right. Xavier, I want you to jump in here. I know you have some questions primed, locked, and ready to go. Yeah, listen. So that was a lot of information you, gave, yeah, you just gave to us about the internet and stuff. Internet and stuff. But I just want to like to hit. I always like to hit the rewind button. What really got you involved into into the IT space? Like, what really pumped your interest into it? Well, so uh, to, to understand where I came from, right. And growing up in on the East side of Buffalo, we, we never had access to um, computers and the internet and just, you know, all of the things that I, I know now it seems so commonplace, but in the nineties, when I grew up the internet was scarce, it was scarce already. And so when I got in the air force and all of a sudden the, we had access to everything. We had access to computers and like next level technology. And we were, everything was connected when I got in the air force already. So just being able to, to quickly gain information and gain knowledge and get information out, you know, sending, being able to being able to simply send an email. Those are the things that I didn't necessarily have access to growing up. And so I would say more than anything, as simple as it sounds, just being around all the lights and the and the different colors of the IT that existed at that time, you know, where I was working in the Air Force, just made me want to understand it more. And when I got out of the Air Force in 2004, I had the opportunity to go and try and do air traffic or to go into IT. And when I sat down and looked at the the number one, the earning potential, right. And, mm -hmm. and a, a technical career field, it was, it was an easy decision to, to go in and push towards technology. And when I moved to DC and started working in the capital region, the, the DC capital region, really, when I came up in it, it moved around technology, everything moved around the ability to disseminate information and to gather information faster to create these systems that were resilient and that couldn't be broken. Mm -hmm. Everything in the capital region is, has three and four versions of it. So that if one goes down, you, you're going to move. On. And, and it, like that culture of just being highly connected and highly uh, technical and high speed, it, it drove me to just want to get more and more information. And the, the more that I learned, the, the more training and certifications that I got, the more, access that I was able to gain, the more income I was able to garner. And it just, right. it, it snowballed in, in a good way. All right. Nice. Now you talk about you worked in the capital region mm -hmm. for how many years? About 12, 13 years. About 12, 13. All right. So, uh, some of what Breaking Bear is all about, it's all about mm -hmm. changing the narrative around young men of color. Mm -hmm. So, uh, me, me and Dan, we want to know, like, what was it like being in a space as a young, as a young man of color at the time? Uh, what was it like? Was there any challenges you faced like being in that field? That's an interesting question. Right? It's a good question. It's a good question. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, my answer, I, I think, may surprise you. So, coming up in DC as a as an adult professional, the first thing that you realize is that it's a it is truly a mixing bowl. The cultures that it, the the number of cultures, the diverse cultures that exist. Yeah. It's it's unreal in, in the District of Columbia and the, not just D.C., but Maryland, Virginia, that sit very close. That's the area that, that I was situated in. And it was to a point where you, you didn't you never knew who exactly you were talking to because mostly everybody was doing something. Right. And so. What that created was a culture that at at different times in my in my life in that area, I was like, I don't know if racism still exists. Mm. Right. That's wow. how, that's how powerful the diversity is in the capital region. Absolutely. You, you see, you see women, you see, you know, 
people of color, you tons know, of young professionals, tons of young professionals. It's just, it, it's a, it's, it's one of my favorite regions to just to, just to be in the midst because, because you'll meet so many different people, different backgrounds that are doing so many uh, great things. But it doesn't mean that, that I've lived a life without having to face barriers. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, moving from DC to Buffalo is where it became real for me again. Right. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of being able to feel and understand that there's a discrimination, there's a prejudice that exists because of the color of my skin, because of where I come from, because of my success. Right. Mm -hmm. Those things really, really started to show their face later on in, in my career here in Buffalo, at least. And I think more than anything, there's a system of prejudice and racism in the business community here Mm -hmm. that keeps people of color from being successful in business here. And it's, it's so tangible. Like I I can, I I can, there's different moments over the last couple of years that I can pull out and I, and I can say, can you believe that in, 2020 or 2019 that this is the conversation we're having um and it's unfortunate but at the same time that's what breaking barriers is about right it's not always going to be easy it's not always going to be you're not always going to be able to just come in and and be as successful as you may have been in other areas and learning how to exist in under those conditions and learning how to be successful under those conditions and sustaining it which is most important is extremely difficult in places where there's that level of systematic uh, prejudice that exists. Yeah. You have to ask yourself outside of me that, that, and and I, I don't, I don't know your life, but I can tell you that over the last five years, I think my company brought in somewhere around 25 million. Right. I dare you to tell me one other person of color that's done that in this city. I don't top of my head. There's, there's, Be higher pressed. There's, there's a reason though. <laughs> there's a reason, right? And and that's one of the, and that's what frustrates me about sometimes the culture that that uh, that exists in this city is that nobody wants to talk about it. Mm. You know, I, I've gone in, in these places where I wanted to like express myself and articulate it and it's frowned upon and and it is not as easy to be successful in Buffalo as I think uh, people would like to think. So, all right. I like this. Uh, I like where it's going. Right. So um, knowing that you're in a community that uh, racism now I feel like it's just more in your face in Buffalo than yeah. it ever has been. Yeah. Right. Um, and knowing that there are systems in place and people in positions that don't necessarily want people of color to thrive. How have you been able to uh, navigate, you know, in the, in the industry that, you know, you're in knowing that these, that there are barriers that exist um, that can inhibit you from being successful. Well, so I, I think a lot of it has to do with my ability to learn from failure, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the things that I'll be candid about in terms of, of my history here in Buffalo is we made a ton of money at my company, but it's no secret that we went through a period where it just seems seemed like there were there was news just news articles and um, all of these rumors and things that kind of surrounded my organization that really had nothing to do with, with, with what we were doing. And I, and I started to, to understand that not until too late, actually though, but I, I started to, to understand that this was outside of my control. And that's the key. You can only control what you can control. What people say about you, how people think about you, how people think you are, who they think you are, what anybody, uh, what anybody's opinion is of you is less important than who you are and what you know that you bring to the table. So I am a technical person. I'm extremely 
good at IT, right? That's that's my that's bad. your lane. That's, that's what you do, lane, right? Under any circumstance, I could shine if we're gonna sit and talk about technology. What I'm not, what I'm not great at, what I wasn't educated in, what I didn't go and and take the time to learn more about as my business grew was the business side of it. Okay. And I think what's important to note when when you ask the question, you know, how how do I continue to move in spite of these things? I had to learn the business piece, right? So af- after getting kicked in the mouth. You can either get up again and get kicked in the mouth again or, or figure out a way to not get kicked in the mouth. And so, unfortunately, that's a painful way to learn. Mm. But sometimes it's a, ne- it, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. And so I tell people, anytime somebody asks me, like, how, you know, give me, give me um, your number one advice about getting into business, I'm, I always tell them, go to school, learn something, right? Take a class, take a course take a certification course, get a degree in business because those things that they teach you in business school are lessons that had I known later on in my life, I feel like my story would be a little bit different. I come from, and, and, and I think you guys will probably understand this because you're from this area. I come from a place where you learn business from the streets. You learn how business is done by watching the people that are in your area, in your, in your neighborhood do business, right? You know, everybody has a OG, right? That, mm-hmm. that, that you go to and they tell you all these stories about things they went through, but it's all from a, it's all from a street perspective. And so right. I brought that into business. I, I was running my business in the same manner. Right. Um, and that doesn't work in all instances. Right. And so I think the, the, the answer to the question, how, how I've been able to, to maintain it's been through a, a perseverance that exists in me because of the things I feel like I went through growing up here. But then the other side of that is that I'm learning every day. I'm learning all these things that, that we go through, um, in business that I go through in life. I take and make it a, and, and turn it into a lesson. I never make the same mistake twice. And that's, that's, it's for that reason, because that's that's where I learned the most lessons. So for a while, you was playing checkers and everybody oh, else was yeah. playing chess. I was playing Monopoly, bro. They, <laughs> they were playing chess. I, I wasn't. I wasn't. I, I wasn't even this, in the same stratosphere. And it's and and again, it's it's you don't you don't understand it when you're in it, right? And my business grew from in 2017. We did. I'm sorry. In, yeah, 2017 we did 300 thousand. 2018, I did 8 million. That's elite. Yeah, that's 1,400 percent. That's 1,400 yeah, percent. You out here putting out whole numbers Man. on the board. <laughs> Listen, let's go. Big facts, right? <laughs> so when you have that type of growth, when you scale, um, when your income scales to that level, you have to put the systems in place to protect it. What when you don't understand business enough? And you try to put those systems in. I knew enough to put the systems in place, but I didn't do the diligence, take the due diligence that was required to make sure that those layers, those people that were sitting in those roles in, in those different layers were the right people for the job, right? And so this is one of the, the things that, that you learn, that I learned coming up in business is, is just how to hire and bring on the right pieces of the puzzle so that you can build something special. And so sometimes it can only, it, it, it can take just one hire, just one bad hire or one bad move and it derails the entire train. So having, having that type of growth, growing that fast and then knowing we're not written, you're not knowing, but bringing in the wrong resources. The next year we, we did 11 million, right? Mm-hmm. We, I, I took, I took a bad, I, well, I don't want to say that. I was able to follow up an $8 million year with $11 million year. And I can tell you, we did not have the resources to be able to do it. That came from that hustle and that perseverance, right. Um, of me going out and making it happen. But at some point it, that, that hustle and all, and, and that grind, it doesn't pay off the same way. You have to have the system in place that, that machine, an 8 million 
now twenty million, now twenty five million dollar machine takes a lot more horsepower to run than what one person can put out. So what are we doing next year? About thirty five. We're gonna see. Man. We're gonna see. I, I, I'm my my goal. Has, my goals have changed, man. It's it's uh, money doesn't drive me the way that it used to, right? Gotcha. And I think more importantly than anything is just I don't want to be known for the guy that came into Buffalo and made a ton of money and dipped. I want to I want to leave a legacy of service and activism that changes lives, right? I came into this city. I remember the first time I met Mayor Brown in 2016, 20, yeah, 2016. And I told him, I said, I'm going to bring innovation to this city. So I'm going to make sure that it's better off now that I'm here. And that's still my goal. My goal mm-hmm. is still, and, and, and it's just grown. Now it's not just to make Buffalo more innovative and more, um, technically sound is to make the country more technically sound and to, and to do something about this massive gap that we have in digital equity. Man, this is truly amazing, man. I'm loving I all the passion it. that you exude, man, all the energy that you're giving I off. It, um, you know, as we sit here out of this conversation, I'm like, Xavier, you still want to go into politics, bro? Because uh, <laughs> tech sound pretty good to me right now. And um, I'm just amazed because I'm just, I'm just trying to think through, you know, the young people in our age bracket, mm-hmm. I'm close to where you at, but I ain't there yet. Um, <laughs> that, that may be in tech. And I know like maybe it's probably a handful of y'all now mm-hmm. that, you know, you and I have met and had this conversation today. So, you know, how do we, how do we inspire, you know, younger generations to mm-hmm. go into IT and, you know, do some of the things that, that you're doing, like, you know, brother Nigel, you mm-hmm. know, he's doing this thing with the apps and, all the other technical stuff that he does. And yeah. like when I talk to young brothers that's, that are in tech, I'm just like, y'all cats, y'all brilliant. Yeah. Like it's, your well, mind work different. Well, you know, the, 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 the thing about when you talk about how educated one has to be to get in technology, it's not as hard as, as people make it out to be. Right. And so Nigel and I, um, I have a great relationship with Nigel and I think what he's doing is amazing. I think coding has really provided an opportunity for for even kids to get into technology, right, at a very, very young age and do some things that, you know, are going to change the world, right? The, the, this, is the, this is the world that we live in right now. Motivating individuals to get into technology shouldn't be as difficult as it is. But again, I think the misnomer, the misconception about technology is that you have to be highly intelligent to, to get involved. Coding in itself is not that difficult, right? It's just about understanding the language and then being able to apply that theory. Even what I do, right, on a, on a large scale, it's not that complicated, right? It's just about understanding technology and there's all these theories that you, that you learn as you, as you grow. They're the, the, I think the, the truest form of motivation, not motivation, but the truest form of the, the, the best avenue to get individuals involved in the tech is to give them an understanding of one, what it takes, right? That it's not that complicated. And then, and then quantify that, right? I can, I can tell you what, you know, like, just like I did with coding, I can go into wireless networks or cybersecurity and tell you why those things overall aren't that complicated, it's when you get into the weeds of it that you have, you just have to be able to understand the, the information that's given to you. But there are, there are, are places now more, more now than I've ever seen before that are giving free training. What Nigel's doing, he, he tries to provide that at a low to no cost to his students. But now, M- you know, MNT has taken on, you know, a big, big push now for bringing in technical resources um, I just posted something the other day, Trocare College. They're doing a, a 12 uh, week course that just introduces people to the idea of technology, right? You go in there with zero experience and they'll tell you what different careers exist beyond coding, right? System administrators and help desk and network administrators and cybersecurity professionals, all those things. And, and that course, that first 12 weeks really takes you through the breaking down all those misconceptions about technology. And so 
they have the there's this in full this is 36 weeks so you got an, uh, another um another session that you that you would take immediately following 12 weeks and that starts to push you into these individual spaces where you can understand or you can start learning how to do something do something specific specific talk to individual on that somebody commented on linkedin today and said i went through this program and i'm in the job that i'm in now because of this program and so i i do as much as i can to pub make public these opportunities and try and make sure that the people in my community the the, the people that look like me understand that these these opportunities are available and just getting, trying to get the appetite wet for technology because people just don't know. Man, that's awesome stuff, dude. Yeah. Xavier, did you have anything else? Because I'm going to bring back our uh, our hot seat uh, segment real <laughs> quick, man. All right. This last thing I want to touch up on, touch up on before Daniel puts you in a very hot seat. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little involved into the politics and mm-hmm. I always, I, I just want to understand, like, if there are any type of, like, any policy, like, any way we could connect, like, internet to policy, like, what are, what would be good policies that you say we could do, like, on the local level, whether it be local, state, mm-hmm. federal, like, what would be a good policies that, like, you, that you think that would be good to implement, like, to get these high, like, high speed, affordable mm-hmm. internet to everyone? Well, I think, I think number one, right? That's a that's a complicated answer, but I'll, I'll say that, that number one is legislate legislation that makes access to internet a civil right. That's the mm. number one thing that we need in terms of of legislation to be able to try and start building a bridge across that divide. When you look at the local level, every place again, every every place has something different that makes their problem and their divide unique understanding that capital is the foundation of everything Mm -hmm. we need to make sure that the the split in capital that is distributed from the federal government is equitable between Mm -hmm. the rural communities and the urban community that's number two because Right now, it's not it's not equitable. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The CARES Act, this latest round of funding, uh, stimulus, each time they put millions. Last this last one, I think it was sixty million, or I'm sorry, sixty billion. They put into infrastructure for technology and to close the digital divide. Mm-hmm. If that money does not get into the urban centers and to the low income centers of the country, there 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 we won't we won't ever get to a place where we have the the digital inclusion that that we're looking for. Um, first question: favorite restaurant in Buffalo. Favorite restaurant in Buffalo. I am going to go with Josh Allentown Pizza, man. Okay, right. And I know that's a strange that's a, that's a strange choice, but let me let me let me explain a little bit. So, mo- like most of us, right, I struggle with with. Uh, dairy products, right? Oh, so, but I know, y'all struggle. I don't know nothing about well, that. No, no, I don't. Most of us, <laughs> some of us are lucky, right? But if if you're a true Buffalonian, like you appreciate more than anything the pizza that we have here, oh, right? Yeah. So, in order for me to like fully enjoy it, I have to get light cheese, and so nobody in Buffalo besides I call it Josh Allentown because they changed time, but nobody besides Josh Allentown Pizza really distributes light cheese the way that I, you know, that I can consume cheese and they do it. And, and also the pizza is amazing too. And they have these garlic um, Parmesan, not garlic Parmesan, but like garlic sesame seed wings. Uh, they're amazing. Oh man. So I think I already know the, the answer, the response to this next question. So uh, wings or pizza and who has the best wings or pizza in Buffalo? Well, hey, your opinion. I would say Allentown Pizza for sure has the best wings. If you have not had those um, sesame seed, I don't, I'm drawing a blank. I think that it's called garlic sesame wings, but they're amazing. Um, and again, just the pizza. I, the pizza, I would say it's a close tie between Allentown and um, Bob and John's. 
Wow. Hacienda. You went outside the box on oh, this. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, you gotta Just, you gotta go into some different spaces to be able to fully fully understand who I am. All right, that's that's different. You know, I think the only time I've had pizza from Josh Allentown was after a night at Savoy or somewhere on Allen. Yeah, oh. <laughs> you gotta check them out, man. They, they they do they do a good job. All right, I'm about to check it out. Um, what's your favorite place to visit? No, favorite city to visit. My favorite city to visit would be a t- a close tie between Washington D.C. and Seattle, Washington. Why Seattle? Well, Seattle reminds me a lot of Buffalo, right? So when I first went to Seattle, it probably was in the 90s sometime, and Seattle was very, very blue-collar, um, big on their football team, not a whole lot of pomp and circumstance. Like, you know that it exists, but who's ever been there? And I started to go again probably the last 10 years or so more frequently, right? I had developed some business out there, and so – the more I went out there and I started to un- to see their growth and skyscrapers pop up. And the, once Microsoft really uh, started to invest in that area, Amazon headquartered there and started to invest in that economy, Google, Apple, all these people started to invest. And now it's become, you know, this really progressive culture that, focuses on technology, but more importantly, the, the people that, that run the technology. So the culture that I, that I implemented into my company, a lot of the, the, um, a lot of the ways that I deliver the technology conversation comes from Seattle and, and what, what I've, what I've learned out there. And, and also it's a, it's just a, it's an amazing place to go and just like, feel safe and relax. It is, it is, it is. I love it. I love it. All right. What's your favorite tech movie? (sighs) My favorite tech movie. Hmm. That's a good one. I would have to say, man, that's a tough one. There's so many good tech movies. Stumped them with this. No, no, no. I, I don't even know why I'm stumped, but it's my favorite movie. My favorite trilogy of all. Is the Matrix? I feel like the Matrix for the the just the depth of how they show the potential progression of technology, right? Okay. How how far we can go with this thing, and if it if it goes in a negative direction, I think the Matrix is pound for pound. I think it's that's magic. All right, we're gonna stay with the movie theme. If you had to pick. An actor to portray you in a movie, who would it be? Me. Okay. <laughs> Nobody can do you like no, you, right? No, it'd be me or or um, you know, Michael B. Jordan, somebody, you know, he got somebody new, almost as flies. He got a new movie coming out too. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for that to drop. All right. Uh Lauren London in that thing too. All right. Really? Yeah. I need to check that out. Yes, sir. It's uh I think April thirtieth is when it drops. You a sports guy? I'm a sports guy. Who's your favorite sports scene? I'm a homer, bro. I bills all day. All right, cool. All right, we straight out there. Yeah. All right, we're going to stay with the sports thing. Let's go. LeBron, Jordan, or Kobe? Jordan, all day. All right, who's your number two, though? Mm, Don't yeah. mess this up, be man. Be honest. Mm. Don't Just mess be, this up, man. Let it come for your heart. I'm going to have to go with LeBron. Oh, <laughs> no, he got to go. Uh, he got to go. Let me, no. let, let me, hold on, hold on, <laughs> real quick. Let me just say this. I love Kobe. My son's named after Kobe Bryant. All right. So, so my love for him is real. Okay. However, All right. LeBron, as a, in totality, yeah. what he's done as a business person, as a sports, um, as a, a sports star, and just as a, as a change agent. For our for our people, I, I don't think I don't think you. Can I can respect that. See me, I I love everything LeBron does off the basketball court. Mm-hmm. I'm just not a fan of his game. It's just he's, he's a just a big bully on the court. I'm right. very sensitive when it comes to this. You know, I'm a <laughs> diehard Kobe fan. Always will be. Um, what's your favorite type of food to eat? My favorite type of food to eat would probably pizza and wings. <laughs> when I when I, I travel a lot, so whenever I go out of town, when I get back. 
The very first thing that I order is a medium pizza with light cheese and pepperoni from Avenues in those links. I mean, not Avenues, <laughs> but uh, Allentown in those links. All right. Um, Will Smith, Michael B. Jordan, since you brought him up, or Denzel? Denzel, all day. All right. All day. I can't argue with that. Music artist that's in heavy rotation for you right now. Mm. Or artist. I definitely would say artist. Um, Trivia Red is for some reason. I just like that dude. I just I like what he's about. Um, I I love his. I dig his music. But also, I listen to a lot of different music. Um, I would probably say second to him would probably be. So many. I'd say probably I listen to a lot of Drake. Right, okay. a lot of his old stuff I listen to. I feel like Drake speaks to me. Yeah, it speaks All right. for me I'm gonna stay on. I'm gonna go off script now because mm-hmm. you said Drake. All right, um, I'm a Drake fan. Good. Biggie, Jay Z, and Nas. Biggie. Okay. Who's your number two? Jay Z. Okay, we good. All right. <laughs> um, now I'm gonna bring it back current for us since you did bring Drake into the conversation. Mm-hmm. If you had to go with Drake, J Cole, Kendrick, or Wale. You haven't said anybody better than Drake. Okay. From just and and people people will will fight and say that he's not a rapper or he's not the lyricist as some of these other guys are, but the dude makes fire music. He does. There's no fire dispute that. music, right? It's, it's no question. Right. I'm not mad at that. I can't argue that. I mean, I, I yeah. <laughs> he. I mean, he got it. He gonna have. He got him. it, man. Right now, he didn't had it for years. For a now, while, too. he's the guy. The guy's got it, and don't seem like he's giving it up no time soon. Um. All right, last two. In your industry, mm-hmm. who's the person that you look up to the most? In my industry, there's a um, there's a gentleman by the name of Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart is from St. Louis, and he built a company called Worldwide Technology. Just like me, out of his house, um, not really understanding what it took, but was willing to give everything he had. He, he has a book and he talks about how he had started this business. He had started getting these contracts and they came and repoed his car right in front of the building while his employees work. And he's taking, he's taking those lessons that he learned coming up in business and now worldwide technology, which is now a $45 billion a year company. He's, it's the largest minority owned business in the entire country. It's wow. the most successful company to come out of the 8A small business program. And he has taken and put St. Louis in a place where now they have their own technology hub because he invests in the community and he, he puts back into where he calls home. All right. You got to put him on your list, Xavier. Yeah. <laughs> Check him out. All right. Uh, who had the, the greatest impact on you growing up? The greatest impact on me growing up would be probably my my mom and short second would be my dad. Um, Just constant um, reinforcement, constant constant exposure to different things, but also just a a steady force, a steady force, never letting me get too far away from where I came from, never letting me get too big, you know, because of the things that I've accomplished, just – Start to finish, those two. All right. Um, I know you mentioned that you have children. Mm-hmm. So what's your favorite activity to do with your kids? Um, so I have my kids are their ages are so diverse. Twenty one, twelve, and five. Oh, twenty one. Yeah, yeah. We so, got to say that for a fatherhood conversation. Yeah, right twenty one. I'm curious yeah, about that one. It's, it's a different. <laughs> it's a, we have a different relationship, but gotcha. um, for my my younger two, the one thing that we connect all we all connect on is just watching movies so mm-hmm. like we'll we can always find a movie that typically the three of us can all enjoy um and so we'll do that at least once a weekend um that we spend together gotcha yeah me and uh my, myself and my daughter we just watched tom and jerry really mm-hmm. yeah. really yeah, yeah. I, i'm excited my uh my kids uh my older son lives here in buffalo uh, my younger kids live in the dc area so I'm going to see them next week, um, so I'm excited. Nice. I'm gonna, Man, I'm gonna that's got to be something to balance, dude. It is, but, you know, up until this point, I've been fortunate and blessed enough to be able to move around the country um, pretty freely. I see my uh, younger kids probably every 
two weeks. Um, and I get, I get a considerable amount of time with them. I, I don't want to be a, a summertime dad. I don't want to be a seasonal dad. Um, I'm, I want to be engaged in my kid's life. So as long as I'm able to uh, provide the lifestyle that they're comfortable with and that I'm comfortable with, and then I can still travel and see them, I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Okay. All right. Last one. I promise. What's your greatest fear? My greatest fear is not being able to leave a legacy of change. I don't want to, it doesn't, it means nothing to me to be able to make the money that I've made, to be able to go to all these places and, and, you know, spit out my resume if I didn't change anything. I feel like I'm one of the few people that I know of that have that ability with what, with the knowledge that I have and the opportunities that have been put in front of me to make lasting change, to make real change, to do something that is going to provide the ability for others to be successful. And and if I, it, it worries me that if I don't make it, that nobody's going to care enough about the problem to want to solve it. That's awesome, man. That's dope. I appreciate it, man. Man, this has been truly an, uh, an amazing conversation today. Um, like I said before, man, you definitely, uh, you inspired me. I appreciate uh, it. Just here, sitting here and just listening and just, just, I'm always excited when I see brothers just doing, doing well and doing things for their community. So appreciate everything that you do, man. And thank you for being on with us today. Uh, I appreciate it. And thank you again. Thank you guys for having me. I didn't know, um, what to expect fully. Um, uh, but I was excited because I understand your platform. I understand what you guys are, are showcasing. And I think it's dope. And if, if there's ever an opportunity for me to, to provide some assistance to you guys, just let me know. I'm, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. And we appreciate that, man. We just, you know, we were trying to shift and change that narrative. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to. All right, y'all with that, it's a wrap. Uh, Breaking Barriers podcast. Once again, my guys, Obama, Xavier Lamar over there. Take care. Mr. Ivy Robinson. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Be sure. Oh, wait, before we do that, you got to make sure you tell everybody where they can oh, yeah, find out that. about everything that you're doing. Yeah, you're right. So um, you guys can catch me on social. My Instagram, Twitter is the Ivory Robinson. Um, if you guys want to check out the website for the business is harpdataconnections.com. I am engaging on this trip right across the country. So if you can do nothing else, Check me out on social media, like, share, repost if you can, because raising the awareness around both the problem and the solution is necessary for us to see some change. And if I can, if I can garner enough support, enough engagement, then I can, again, I feel like I can make, I can start making some change. Tesla's um, going to be involved. Tesla's going to be sponsoring me. I'm working with, um, a number of large organizations, other organizations that I don't want to say their name yet because they're not signed, but gotcha. um, people are getting behind the project. And so again, social media, the Ivy Robinson. And I think my Facebook is just Ivy Robinson. All right. Well, if there's anything that we can do, make sure you let us know, man. Yeah. For I sure. appreciate it. Just, just a shout out, like share, subscribe, all those good things. All right. All right. Well, you know, uh, for all of our followers, subscribers out there, you can check out the, the uh, Breaking Berries podcast on YouTube, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and any other streaming platform that I forgot. Uh, once again, Daniel Robertson, Xavier Lamar, Ivy Robinson. A uh, special thank you to Say Yes Buffalo, the Greater Buffalo Racial Equity Roundtable, and the Oshai Foundation. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Peace. Peace.